Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you can do better than that. You know, in the seminary, we used to greet the day in the Lord in Laudator Jesus Christus. Laudator in Eternum was the answer. In plain English, that is, praise be the Lord Jesus Christ, now and forever. And in my home of my parents in Polish, the language in which our Lord spoke to Sister Faustina, the greeting is niech będzie pochwalony Jezus Chrystus na wieki wieku amen. I won't ask you to learn that, but I will ask you to learn the response now and forever. Now when I praise him, I want to hear your heart and your voices praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be the Lord Jesus Christ. Now and well, that's very good, but I want it excellent. <laughs> really let us praise the Lord with our whole heart and ask his blessing upon this assembly honoring mercy. Praise be the Lord Jesus Christ. Now and, and he is praised. You notice the banner, the banner in front of you, and the banner behind me, the theme of the conference, mercy, our mission. I guess you can remember, Ma, Mary, our mother of mercy, mercy is our mission. And like a professor, I'm going to tell you 
what I want to share with you in the theme of the conference. Mercy, our mission, is the mission of Christ, and so our mission, and that is to make mercy present. That's going to take some time to explain, but mercy is our mission. And we make our mission mercy when we make mercy present. Okay, I told you what I will tell you. Now I'm going to have to tell you what I told you, and then at the end I'll tell you what I told you so you can remember what I told you. Amen? Amen. Now I come to you as a professor, so you're going to have to expect an exam at the end. So don't be afraid. I'll ask you to take out your pencils and to memorize some things. We might even have a multiple choice test. So remember what we're going to say. I told you I'm a professor. I'm in a community of the Congregation of St. Basil. They're priest teachers. I was ordained in 1954. And for the first 16 years of my priesthood, I was involved in the field of biochemistry. As a professor of biochemistry in a public university in Canada, I taught and researched and published in that field. Enzymes and DNA and RNA and all these crazy things. And then, through the experience of the Holy Spirit in 1968, 24 years ago, the experience of being baptized in His Holy Spirit, it turned me around and moved me right out of that academic field into priest retreat work. And for 16 years, I worked with priests, giving retreats in all sorts of different places. In fact, even here at All Hallows and back in 1978. And then in 1985, traveling so much, I, I just began to get burnt out, and a priest challenged me to go to solitude. And I went to solitude with the Camaldolese. And there, after 16 years of work with priests, I was challenged and heard that voice within my heart, proclaim my mercy. Proclaim my mercy. And I've moved full time into that, proclaiming God's mercy. And so here's a, a sometime professor talking about God's compassionate love for those who are trapped in the misery of human condition, sinful, weak, discouraged, to talk to you and talk primarily to myself so that I would experience that mercy and could tell you about it. How many here need God's mercy? Would you raise your hands? Is there anybody who didn't raise his hand? <laughs> we all need it. And you say, well, what is this mercy that we need? It's not a thing. It's not something you go to the store and buy, like you'd buy a loaf of bread or a pound of butter. Mercy, the Father revealed in His Son, Jesus Christ, and mercy came in person. Jesus Christ is the mercy of God, incarnate, personified, visible, tangible, and He is among us now through His Holy Spirit dwelling in our hearts. But we must open our hearts to that presence. And what we want to see is how God over the centuries of the church has instructed His people on what this is, this mercy, this love poured out. You say, well, what is mercy? It's God's love poured out through the pierced heart of Jesus. It's God's love poured out for us who are in misery. It's God's love and compassion poured out for us who are discouraged or confused or in darkness, depressed or bored or angry or sinful. Then the litany can go on. If you haven't identified yourself with one of those, we'll touch on one of those as we go along. <laughs> we all need mercy. The fathers of the church like St. Augustine, theologians like St. Thomas Aquinas, mystics like Sister Faustina Kowalska, popes like John Paul II, 
have described God's mercy as his greatest attribute. What is he like? He's mercy itself. And that is one of the great ways that Jesus described himself to Sister Faustina. I delight in the title mercy. I am love and mercy itself. You say, how is that possible? Because the Father, in his love, continually creates us. And that's mercy. We are, you are alive and exist because of the Father's mercy. The Son, in loving you here and now, continually redeems you, forgives you, heals. That's mercy. The Holy Spirit, pouring his love into your heart, right here and now, sanctifying you, making you holy. That's mercy. But there's got to be a better way to think of this. Let me give you a few illustrations. St. Thomas Aquinas, that theologian of the church, spoke of mercy from the Latin term, misericordia. You have the similar word in French and Italian and Spanish. Misericordia, first word, miser, means miserable. Cordia means heart, cardiac, you know the word, you have a cardiac attack. So really, St. Thomas says, what does mercy mean? It's having a miserable heart. <laughs> what do you mean, a miserable heart? It means that your heart is in pain over somebody else's pain, and you take pains to relieve that pain. That's very interesting. That's how he describes what mercy is about. Well, over the years, I've been trying to look for a mnemonic, like a cheer, that would summarize what mercy is. We say that God is mercy itself, creating, loving, redeeming us in a compassionate love. And for years, I've tried to think of a mnemonic, you know, where the letters, you know, like a crossword puzzle, just, or, or the scrabble. Or we in the United States, in some of the uh, football games, have a cheer. If we're going to have a cheer for mercy. We would say, give me an M, give me an E. Give me an R, give me a C, give me a Y. All right, let's try this one. Give me an M, mighty. Give me an E, eternal. Give me an R, redeeming. Give me a C, compassionate. Give me a Y, Yahweh. What is mercy? It is the mighty, eternal, redeeming, compassionate Yahweh. It's not a thing. It's the living presence of God himself in your heart. The love of God, his mercy, his spirit is poured into your hearts through the gift of the spirit, Paul tells us in Romans 5. That's what mercy is. In the Old Testament, in the covenant with the chosen people of Israel. Mercy is the very experience of the people that God wanted them to experience his compassion and love and be then messengers of that compassion and love to the whole world. And over the centuries of God's teaching them through the prophets, they come to understand mercy. I just might mention the Hebrew word in the so where they're hesed, the main word, which is the loving kindness of God. But each of those words, that loving kindness, that hesed, is always associated with a second word that varies, different second words. It could be with the word emet, which is the faithfulness of God. It's loving faithfulness. Or it could be the loving kindness, the hesed, plus a word like rahamim, which comes from the mother's womb, the tenderness and the compassion of God. And you know what? The music ministry that you just heard, they're under the title of rahamim, which is the compassion of God, is tenderness. And the words go on. It's like the loving kindness and the shalom, the peace, the yeshua, God saving. But eventually it came to mean the covenant, the beret, which means we are made members of God's family, a blood relationship, that God is our Father, and he cares for us and loves us. 
And because of his promise that he is our Father, he will be merciful as we call upon him. But then Jesus came. And he not only accepted all of what mercy is in the revelation through the prophets of the Old Testament, but was added to it that mercy came in person. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, the living Word, by the power of the Spirit, born of Mary, walked among us, revealing the Father's mercy and making that mercy present. Isn't it beautiful that Jesus told us about mercy? He told us to be merciful even as our Father is merciful. In the Sermon on the Mount, he said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And in revealing this, he said, When you see me, when you're speaking to Philip at the Last Supper, you see the Father. When you see my mercy, you see the mercy of the Father. But we know that that speaking of mercy healing of mercy and deliverance, that wasn't enough for him. He wanted to show the fullness of the mercy of the Father, and he went to the fullness of that revelation on the cross. And when his side was pierced, blood and water gushed forth. The Spirit of the living God, the church was born. His mercy flooded out for the whole world to receive. And we are called to receive that mercy. Mary stood there, receiving it, making it available to all of us. John was there as the beloved disciple representing each of us, receiving that mercy. And what is most characteristic of the mercy of Jesus? Readiness to forgive. He gives the parable of the prodigal son to describe the merciful father, ready to forgive, waiting for the son to come home, seeing him on the horizon, running out to meet him, embracing him, ordering his servants to put on a ring, giving him the breast of clothes, kill the fatted calf for the celebration. And even when the elder son got angry because of jealousy, Again, the Father went out to reach to him and had mercy on the elder son as well. You know, sometimes, and reflecting on the parable of the prodigal son, I wonder, some days, you know, I feel like the prodigal son, but other days I feel like the older son. I feel, oh, what are they doing that for? And the, the judgments. But on the third day, I feel like both of them at the same time. <laughs> So no matter whether you feel like the older son, you know, you've been trying to be faithful and yet everything's collapsing around you, or you feel like the younger son, you've kind of gone off the track and now you wonder how to get back on, or sometimes it's a combination of them both. The Father is merciful. He has given us his own son, Jesus Christ, divine mercy itself, to dwell in your heart. That's what the scriptures tell us about mercy. But if there were to be a phrase that summarizes the scripture on mercy and summarizes God's plan of mercy, what does he have in store for us? I think it's the text in Romans 11:32. In the letter to Romans, we have the main theology of St. Paul. In chapters 9, 10, and 11, he speaks to the fact that by the mercy of God, the Jewish people were chosen as his own people, and they were to be the mercy of him revealed to the nations, but they failed, and they were cut off. And by the mercy of God, we were placed into that root by a graft, but we failed too. And it seems as though God wished to show mercy that they too may receive mercy. And in verse 32, he goes on to say, God has imprisoned all of us in disobedience in order that he might have mercy on all. There's the key. God's plan is to have mercy on all, everybody. 
But you know the difficulty is? He's created us free. And we can resist. We can say no. We can keep our hearts locked. But we all need that mercy. We all need to open it up. And Paul goes on to say in a great canticle of mercy how we are to describe the merciful God. Immediately he says, how deep are the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How inscrutable his judgments, how unsearchable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given him anything so as to deserve return? For from him and through him and for him all things are forever and ever. Amen. And then Paul goes on to say, and now I beg you through the mercy of God to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, your spiritual worship. That's what we are to do. Offer our whole beings, that says the body, everything that we have that is created as a worship to the living God. What a challenge. You wonder, how is that possible to do? That's one of the questions we want to look at and consider. How is it possible? One clue on how it is possible is to consider what our Holy Father has said in a series of encyclicals on divine mercy, on the Holy Spirit, and the mission of the Redeemer. Let's consider these. Our Holy Father, in his second encyclical, Rich in Mercy, Dives, in misericordia, that Latin term that is described the encyclical, says that Jesus came to reveal the Father and reveal him as mercy. The first sentence of that encyclical is said, God, who is rich in mercy, Jesus Christ, his Son, has revealed as Father. And throughout the encyclical then he says, Jesus came to reveal that mercy and to make it present. Do you remember I told you right at the beginning what I'm going to say? That the mission of mercy that is our, Christ's and ours is to make mercy present. To make it here and now. Make it visible, tangible, available through prayer, through good works, through the variety of spiritual and corporal works of mercy. And the Holy Father says, how did Jesus make that present? He said he made love, which is more powerful than death. He made love, which is more powerful than sin. Love, which is more powerful than evil, present among us in Jesus Christ. And the fullness of this at the cross. There it was. He went all the way. In the first encyclical, Jesus came to, re to reveal the Father's mercy. Jesus came to make mercy present. That's his mission. And so ours. In the encyclical on the Holy Spirit, which was like a third encyclical in a series, his first one on the Redeemer of Man, and the second on divine mercy, and the third on the Lord and giver of life, on the Holy Spirit, he says that the Holy Spirit... He's quoting here John six, six, uh, chapter 16, saying the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. He convicts the world that is in us of sin. Not in order to condemn us, no. But he points to that sin and makes us aware of that sin. Why? In order to bring us to the source of mercy. Bring us to salvific love. And you know what that salvific love is, he says? That's mercy. God will awaken the sin within you. The closer you come to God, the more you realize that in fact you are a sinner, greater than the sinners around you, because as yet you have not fully yielded to his mercy. The greater the saints, you say, they realize how sinful they are, and it's true because they understand 
It's only God's mercy that keeps us in his bosom. And so the more you are aware of your nothingness, the more you are aware of your darkness, the more you are aware of your sin, the more you then depend on God's mercy, thanks be to God. And the Holy Spirit then convicts us not to condemn, but convicts us in order that we go to the cross, the pierced side of Jesus, stand under the font of mercy, and be cleansed. And then the Spirit can make us channels of that mercy to others. In the th third encyclical that I'd like to point out of the Holy Father, one of the most recent ones, Redem Torres Missio, the mission of the Redeemer, a very important one that challenges the church to a new time of evangelization to the nations. And that means you and me. And what he says is that Jesus came to make the kingdom of God present. And then he explains what that is. He says, to make the kingdom of God present, we make God's mercy present. We believe in him, and it means to believe in his merciful love. And again, the third encyclical, we say, the mission of Jesus was to make his kingdom present, to make mercy present. And so our mission is to make mercy present. And say, how can you do that? How is that possible? Well, I'm going to try to answer that, but it's going to take a few moments. And we're going to back up for a moment and look at some things that are really absolutely for sure. I say there are three absolutes in the world. What does that mean? You can be absolutely sure of number one, your own death. I'm going to die. You're going to die. We can be absolutely sure of that. Any doubts here? All right. We can be sure of that. What else can you be sure of? You can be sure of that every one of you have suffering and pain in your life. Maybe we should ask for some more questions here. How many here? I'm going to ask you three sets of questions. Just to get a sense, we'll build up to this. How many here have experienced Jesus Christ in their lives? Would you raise your hands? You know, some experience, you know that Jesus Christ loves you. Okay, look around. You know, you see the hands, the sea of them. Second question. How many have experienced the Holy Spirit in their lives? Would you raise your hands? His presence, his love, his healing, his guidance. Okay. Now, the third question, the one I want to know. At this point, how many here now in their own lives have suffering and pain? Would you raise your hands? Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know what you just said? You said you experienced Jesus in your life. Second question, you experienced the Holy Spirit in your life. And now you're telling me in the third question, now you're suffering. Now, come on. Now, now look, just to make sure this third question, I'm going to ask it again around the other way. Is there anyone here that has no suffering, no pain in their lives? Would you please raise your hand? You have no pain, no suffering? Are you a Christian? <laughs> you haven't joined Jesus on the cross. You don't have anything to offer then. I don't say that you're not with joy. I'm just saying, do you have any pain or suffering? See that? Look, look around. You know, how many hands do you see where there's no pain and no suffering? Well, we better take a look at that. Because the third, see, I told you the first absolute is we're all going to die. The second thing is absolute, we all have pain and suffering, sickness, infirmity. But the third absolute thing that we can be sure of is that God is merciful. You say, wait a, wait, wait a minute. You just told me that God is merciful and here I'm suffering. I mean, well, this is a contradiction. This is, of course it is. It's a paradox of Christianity. How can that be? This issue of suffering and pain and evil 
is probably the greatest issue that keeps people from faith in God. Three quarters of the world live as atheists. Two thirds have never heard of a merciful God. And the one third, the Christians, the Jews, the Muslims, who are supposed to have heard of a merciful God, act as though he weren't merciful. How can we consider the problem of evil? We escape evil and suffering and pain and tension and boredom by every possible way. The media, the radio, the t telly, everything tells us get it away from it, take this pill, take this drink, take this vacation, read this, wear that, go there. Nonsense! Jesus says, take up your cross daily and follow me. He didn't say, escape from it. He said to embrace it and make use of it for the sake of others. And this is exactly what the Father's plan was in Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, in order that we may not perish but may have life eternal. And how did he give him? Right to the cross. Jesus embraced our sin. Jesus embraced our infirmities. Jesus embraced our suffering. And by that merciful love, transformed suffering into mercy. If you ever doubt that, look at the cross. Gaze upon the pierced heart of Jesus and see the source of all mercy. Jesus came to make mercy present, and he made it present by embracing suffering and love, healing, infirmity, and making it the source of suffering. He implanted right in the center of our suffering the very seed and answer to our crisis, and we try to reject it and throw it away in every possible way. And the very seed and answer is within you. When the Israelites in the desert, because of their idolatry and mumbling and grumbling, were punished by God by the seraph serpents, they were bit and poisoned and many died, they cried out for mercy and the Lord instructed Moses, make a bronze serpent, lift it up on the staff, and anyone who will gaze upon that serpent will be healed. In other words, look upon that serpent, the very thing that has caused your problem. Embrace it and see that within it is the very source of mercy because God has transformed suffering to a source of mercy. That is the greatest paradox and mystery of our Christian faith. It's God's merciful love in Christ Jesus on the cross that has transformed your suffering, my suffering. The Holy Father, in writing on suffering in his letter, The Christian Meaning of Human Suffering, Salvifici Dolores, put something very interesting. This is my translation. He says, how do you suffer? With great pain. The fact that you embrace the suffering with love will not take away the pain. We're not asking you that you rejoice in the pain, but you rejoice in the fact that that pain now has meaning and value. It is now a source of mercy for souls, for souls, for souls, for the kingdom. And that is how you make mercy present. That is the mission of Jesus. That is how he made mercy present. That his blood and water gushed out as a font of mercy for us all. And that's why we pray that prayer of Sister Faustina, that the Lord taught her to renew her consecration with him. O oh, blood and water, which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus, as a font of mercy for us, I trust in you. You know, in order to do this, 
We need something special. You know, how can you, how can I, embrace suffering with the peace, joy, and love of Christ to St. Paul, of Peter, whose feast we are today, Sister Faustina? Huh, I don't know. There's a Latin phrase we used to use in the seminary, nemo dat quad non habet, which in plain old American English is, you can't give what you ain't got. Do you understand what that means? If you haven't got it, you can't give it. If you don't have God's mercy, you can't give it. I need God's mercy in order to fulfill his command, be merciful even as your Father is merciful. How can I possibly be merciful like the Father? Impossible! Except for the mercy of God poured into your heart through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Unless you're immersed in that mercy, unless you're plunged into it, submerged into it, like dive into it in like an ocean, the Greek word uses baptized. Unless we are baptized into his mercy, how can we ever possibly be merciful like a father? Unless we're baptized in his mercy, how is it possible to embrace suffering constantly, day in and day out? The boredom, the confusion, the fears, the anxieties, the depressions, the sickness, on and on and on. God's mercy is greater than sin. God's mercy is greater than our misery. God's mercy is greater than death. God's mercy is greater than all evil. God's mercy is greater than his whole creation. I need and you need, we need to be immersed in God's mercy, to be baptized in his mercy. We need it to receive it, to know it, to experience it, and so be apostles of mercy and carry out our mission of making mercy present. I need that mercy. I need to be baptized in his mercy to fulfill that command, to proclaim his mercy, to be a missioner, to be an apostle, to practice mercy, to plead for mercy, to glorify his mercy, to make his mercy present. I just need it. But then the question comes, well, if we need it, how do you get it? If I haven't got it, what do I do? You ask for it. <coughs> In the Gospel of Luke, Luke 11, he said, ask, seek, knock. And that spells A-S-K. A, ask. B, C. <laughs> no, we're not the ABCs, we're the A-S-K. Ask. S, seek, K, knock. Ask, seek, knock. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him, Luke continues quoting the words of Jesus. He'll give you the spirit of mercy. Plead for it, ask for it, till you have it. And you say, how do I know I have it? When there is a peace and a joy and a love in embracing the suffering. What else do I do besides ask for it? You trust. I say, what do you do when you trust? I don't know how to trust. I couldn't trust my father and my mother I wouldn't trust my brothers or sisters. And some priests will say, I wouldn't trust my bishop. Oh, I wouldn't trust my superior. I don't trust my boss. I don't trust myself. How do you start? You just say, Jesus, I trust in you. Just start saying it from your heart. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Because as soon as you express that act of the will, which trust is, it's not a feeling. It's a decision, an act of will, giving God permission to be merciful to you. Jesus, I trust in you, is saying, Jesus, you may be merciful to me because that's what you want to do. And uh, I'm opening my heart just as much as I can right now. Flood it. Our Lord told Sister Faustina, even if the greatest sinner turns to me with trust, he will quickly grow to be sanctified. If he would only open their hearts with trust, I would do the rest. If only they would accept my mercy with trust. And it's that word, if only, 
describes your free will. You have the key. Just turn that key and let the doors open and the floodgates of his mercy immerse you, baptize you. And, and so what is this trust? But it's the allowing God to be merciful to you. It's the key to being merciful. It's the key to offering your sufferings. It's the key to glorifying God's mercy. It's the key to our mission. Give God the permission to be merciful by your trust. Ask him. Well, in case you can't remember what trust is, here I go with another cheer. T-R-U-S-T. Trust. trust. T, total. R, reliance. U, upon. S, saving. T, truth. Total reliance upon saving truth. In the Gospel of John, chapter 8, he says, If you believe in the Gospel, the truth will set you free. And if you believe in the Son, the Son will really set you free. That is saving truth. That is trusting in mercy itself. Jesus personified mercy who's come in person. Maybe one more stress on the place of mercy and trust. It all begins with God's mercy. That's the beginning and end, our very existence, our salvation, our sanctification. If I could just, God's mercy is there, we're here. And the connection, the pipeline that opens up God's mercy to us is trust. How important it is that we beg God with trust and humility for his mercy. Just repeat. Trust in you. God, you are God. You are merciful. You care for me. Help me. And if you don't know how to do it, go to mom and say, Ma, help me to trust. You are blessed because you believed the word of God spoken to you. Help me to trust. And she will. Say, how do I live in this ocean of mercy. How do I live baptized in his mercy? So his mercy floods through me out to others and radiates to others. I would say, stay in the heart of Mary. In the heart of Mary is that great reservoir of mercy, and she places us right in the merciful heart of Jesus. And Jesus brings us to the bosom of the Father. Just say, Mary, you're my mother. Take me into your heart. Place me in the heart of Jesus. And again, you may say, stand with Mary at the cross. There the beloved disciple. There, you're in the place there where the beloved disciple was. Stand under those rays of mercy. In the United States, some of our Pentecostal brethren have a little ditty song that I delight. It goes with uh, these words. I want to stand under the spout where the glory comes out. Well, I like to little change just a bit. I want to stand under the spout where the mercy comes out. Stand under the rays. I find myself just sometimes have to, if the blessed sacrament isn't there to be irradiated, I just have that image of the merciful Savior and let the rays of mercy just irradiate me because I need it so that I carry it with me not only in the home, in the office, but even in the car. Be irradiated. Stand under the rays of mercy. And then pray. This is a way to live. Pray that mercy. Ask for that mercy. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, mercy. Pray the chaplet. And throughout the whole Eucharist, we renew the mercy of God within us. That sacrifice of his mercy the miracle of mercy and his presence in Holy Communion. You can take some of the scriptures that maybe are very much alive with you. One word that is very much alive with me since early days of secondary school, we call it high school in the United States, was a word from St. Paul's letter to the Church of Thessalonians. His first letter, chapter 5, 16, verse and following. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and all things give thanks. 
for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus regarding you all. Very simple. Just one, two, three. Rejoice, which is a decision always to, to praise him and acknowledge him. Not that you'll feel joy, but you will rejoice. It's an act of decision, an act of the will. Pray without ceasing. Jesus' mercy at every situation. And in all things give thanks. Acknowledge that God is a source of mercy, and you acknowledge it and return it to him. Rejoice, pray, and give thanks. And Paul goes on to say, this is the will of God. You want to know what the will of God is in every moment? Rejoice, pray, and thank. And this will of God is in Christ Jesus regarding you all. It's plural. It's for everybody. And so we can say that God wants to have mercy on us all. And he's going to have mercy on us whether we like it or not because he's going to win. Sometimes if we ask for mercy, Obviously, it comes immediately. Sometimes it's the next day. Sometimes it's down the line. You know, a year is like a day or a thousand years to the Lord. He will have mercy in his perfect timing. And we can see right around us that there's something very special happening that we're beginning to follow as church very closely in the footsteps of Jesus. And I'm looking now to what can we expect. We see this new interest in God's mercy. We see the great interest in this last century and especially in this last decade of Marian revelations and apparitions. We see in these last 25 years a movement of the Spirit in the church and a charismatic renewal. And yet at the same time we see the travail, the hurt, the confusion, the divisions, the secularization. That's the pattern that we're in. We read the signs of the times. And yet, it's the pattern of Christ. Look at Jesus. Born of Mary by the Spirit, led by the Spirit, through the baptism, through the temptations of the desert, doing the works of the Father, healing, delivering, preaching, training his apostles, then led to the cross and through the eternal Spirit, offering himself as a holocaust, and then raised by that spirit to new life, now reigns and sends that spirit to us. And what we're experiencing now, you see Mary revealing her son. You see the Holy Spirit revealing his works in Mary. You see the travail of the cross within our lives and our own suffering and the suffering of the church and world. The issues that are facing you as an Irish nation of abortion and divorce and secularization, loss of vocations, weakening of the faith. It's a travail. You are in spiritual warfare, but a travail means a giving a new birth to. And what can you see in the future? What can you expect? You will see the full triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. You will see miracles of mercy. And you will see the radiance of the Eucharist. These are times coming. These are new generation. We used to speak of, in America, in the 60s and 70s, of the me generation. I speak of a new me generation, spelled M-M-E. Mercy, Mary, and the Eucharist. This is all the work of the Spirit. It's the work through his church. It's a preparation for his glorious coming, a glorious coming of reign of his peace and justice in our lives, in the church and the world. Before his coming in glory, which is not a physical coming, but a spiritual coming of radiance in our hearts and the church, we will see the necessary purification Chastisement, yes. Tribulation, yes. But look forward to the great miracle of mercy that will renew the face of the earth in the glorious coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Are you ready? Are you vigilant? Are you waiting? We are called to that watchful alertness, to that interceding trust. The Scriptures tell us that God is mercy and he wants to have mercy on all.
And he commands us to be merciful like our Heavenly Father. We can only do it if we are immersed in his mercy. Ask him. Plead for it. Demand it because this is what he wants. He wants us to plead like Abraham, like Moses, like Faustina, for mercy on us and the whole world. That the whole world be immersed in that mercy. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are the source of all mercy. Flood your mercy upon all the people here, upon the whole Emerald Isle. May they see through that green your mercy, the radiance of your blood and water. Transform the lives of this island to be forgiving, to be merciful in the north and the south, in the young and the old, in the secular and the religious. Flood us with your mercy. Transform our lives that we truly may be your living body, that we may be living Eucharist, that we may live in the heart of Mary, in the heart of your beloved Son, Jesus. O, o blood and water which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus, as a fount of mercy for us, I trust in you. O blood and water which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus, as a font of mercy for us, I trust in you. O blood and water, which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus, I trust in you.